All right, this is a video lecture covering the first part of the skeletal system. When we look at the skeletal system, it is an organ system. Bones are considered an organ. And my computer's being a little stubborn here. All right, so looking at the functions of the skeletal system, um, support is an important function. It holds our bodies in position and supports the organs that lie underneath the bone. Protection, it provides a hard covering to protect our soft tissues such as our brain and spinal cord. Um, movement, we together with muscles, we are able to move because our bones have joints which bend at the knee and the elbow, the wrist, the neck, the waist. We have uh, the ability to move working with muscle, so uh, bones can't move without the help of muscle. So we can't say it's completely responsible for movement because without muscles, the skeleton would not move. Storage, um, our bones store calcium and phosphate within the bone tissue itself, and it also is a storage site for red and white blood cells as well as fat, which we find inside bones in the bone marrow, and we'll talk about that in more detail. So when you talk about blood cell production, our red and white blood cells and platelets are formed within the inside of our bone in that medullary cavity. So we have a ready supply of red blood cells and white blood cells, and this continues throughout life, it slows down a little bit as we age, but this is occurring in the bone marrow inside the shafts of our long bones and as well as in the epiphyses well, that inside the shafts of long bones in children, I should say, and then in the epiphyses of um, humans throughout their life, adults and children. So when you think about the skeletal system, another important tissue that plays a role in the skeletal system's functioning is, and development is cartilage. There's three types of cartilage that we find in the body. The most abundant type and common form of cartilage is hyaline cartilage. We looked at this in lab. It, it has the fisheye soup appearance. So here we can see these little spaces here, these white spaces with the dark centers. Um, the dark centers are actually, actually the nuclei of cartilage cells, and these cartilage cells are called chondrocytes. So these chondrocytes are actually what produces the substance that makes up cartilage. There's all this pink material that's stained here, that flexible, glistening cartilage we see if you're eating chicken. Um, for example, that is uh, the matrix. It's the non-living part of this hyaline cartilage. It's produced by the cells within these spaces. So the spaces are, are cavities, are called lacuna. So each little white space here is a cavity called a lacuna. And inside of it is a cartilage cell, which we call a chondrocyte. So when you think of the word or the prefix chondra, I want you to think cartilage, because that's the prefix we use for cartilage. So chondrocytes, site means cell, chondra means cartilage. So these are cartilage cells inside of these lacuna, and they secrete the substance here that we know as cartilage. So cartilage is very flexible, and it has a nice shock absorbency. So we find um, hyaline cartilage lining the ends of our long bones. We call that the articular cartilage, where we see the cartilage at the end of long bones. The epiphyseal plate is an area of growth in children that we see in the ends of long bones, allowing them to grow in length. That will disappear after we're done growing and becomes um, an epiphyseal line. We also talked about that in lab. And our entire skeleton, other than the skull and the clavicle, develops from hyaline cartilage. So we have a completely cartilage um, skeleton early in our fetal development, and slowly that ossifies or becomes bone. So elastic cartilage is another type of cartilage. It's very uh, flexible, more flexible than hyaline cartilage, so we find this in the ear and the epiglottis, which is a flap of cartilage that covers the opening to the airways, covers the larynx when we swallow to prevent food from entering our airways. So this is a very flexible type of car um, cartilage and again um, it's called elastic cartilage. 
Fibril cartilage is a very strong type of cartilage, a um, great deal of shock absorbency, very resilient. So we find this in areas where there's a lot of pressure between bones. For example, um, between the femur and the tibia, we have fibril cartilage. We, they form these cup-like structures called menisci, and that protects um, the knee joint from damage. Um, maybe you've heard of people that have torn a meniscus, either the lateral or medial meniscus, and um, that needs to be repaired because cartilage has a very poor blood supply. So all three types of cartilage, whether it be hyaline, elastic, or fibrocartilage, all have a very poor blood supply. So when we have injuries to our cartilage, often they won't heal without surgical intervention. So it's important that we take care of our cartilage, that we, you know, properly strengthen the muscles around our joints so when we're participating in activities we don't do damage to the cartilage because it's very very slow in healing. So here we can see the thick collagen fibers that make up fibrocartilage. That's what gives it its strength. So between the vertebrae in your back and also again between the femur and the tibia at the knee is where we find this very resilient, strong, durable fibrocartilage. So when we look at what makes up bone then, we look at the uh, structure of it, the histology of this tissue. Remember that it's a connective tissue and it's found in the margins of our long bones and the edges of bones where we see solid white material, that's compact bone. And 35% of that is organic, which means it's made from a substance produced by living cells within the bone. Um, primarily, carbon is a major component, and that is collagen and proteoglycans. Collagen is a protein, it's a structural protein produced by the cells within bone, and proteoglycans are a glycoprotein that helps absorb and keep water within this bony tissue, this compact bone, which provides some cushion and resiliency. So both of these tissues together, are proteins, sorry, and uh, glycoproteins, work together to provide cushion within that bone. The inorganic po portion of bone is called hydroxyapatite, and that's just another, another name for a mineral salt, calcium phosphate. So we know that calcium is important in our diet to keep our bones strong, and that's the portion, the 65% of our bone made up of calcium phosphate. So it is important that we get calcium in our diet, as well as vitamin D, because vitamin D allows us to absorb calcium from our digestive tract into our blood. So without vitamin D, we can't grab the calcium coming in through our diet into the bone. So again, most of our bone is calcium phosphate, and a smaller percentage of that is collagen and proteoglycans. Again, collagen and proteoglycans make bone flexible, where calcium salts make bone hard. So if we look at the different cells within bone, there are three major cells that are actively at work. Um, either maintaining, building, or breaking down bone. Osteoblasts build bone. Osteocytes maintain the bone after it's been ossified and built. And osteoclasts break down or cleave bone. So think of clasts cleave, blasts build, and osteocytes maintain. All of these cells originate from stem cells, which are all the same, but then they differentiate into the three different types of cells depending on the signals given uh, within the body. There's three types of bone we see in the body. There's woven bone, which is a very fragile, um, newly made bone. Collagen fibers are not um, oriented in any particular way, so it's very fragile, subject to breaking. It's only um, during early bone development that we find woven bone. And then we have cancellous or spongy bone. Another name for cancellous bone is spongy bone which has a spongy appearance, so it has the kind of a bony, thin bony fibers that make up its, the bone, and those bony fibers we call trabeculae. And compact bone is solid bone. You won't see any open spaces within this bone. It's just solid white bone, very, very dense. So when you look at the anatomy of a typical long bone, we did talk about this in lab but remember that the ends of the bones are called the epiphyses. So this is an epiphysis, this is an epiphysis, and the hyaline cartilage that lines the end of the epiphysis is called articular cartilage. Because when one bone 
moves against another bone, we call that articulation. So when we see hyaline cartilage at the end of a long bone, we call it articular cartilage because it's where another bone will articulate with this bone. And this bone here happens to be the humerus, so this is what would actually fit into the bone that forms the top of the shoulder, which would be the scapula and the clavicle. But we'll talk more about that when we get into lab. So we see there's spongy bone here that makes up the epiphyses, and there's compact bone, where we said it's very dense, it's solid bone here. Um, on the edges. And then there's yellow marrow that fills this cavity, which is called the medullary cavity. This yellow marrow is primarily fat, but in children that marrow is red marrow. So only in children do we see red marrow in the diaphysis or in the medullary cavity of long bones because it's replaced by fat in adults. That's why it's yellow here. So what we find in red marrow are red blood cells, all the different white blood cells for immune function, as well as platelets to help with stopping of bleeding. So very, very important function in children that are still developing their immune system. So when someone has a bone marrow transplant, typically that occurs with people that have leukemia and they have abnormally growing white blood cells that don't function properly to provide immunity. So people with leukemia have low immunity. Uh, their red blood cells are crowded out by the cancerous white blood cells, so they end up being anemic as well with easy bruising and um, poor oxygen delivery. So as a result, some of these patients will receive what's called a bone marrow transplant. And because adults don't have um, red marrow in the shafts of their long bones, a source of these um, healthy cells for a bone marrow transplant are found in the ilium or in the hip bone here. In the spongy bone there is where we can find some healthy red marrow for donating to someone who needs a bone marrow transplant. So when we look at, again, what makes up bone, we see that bone is made up of two different components. We have the uh, collagen, which makes bones flexible. So without calcium, our bones would be too flexible, having only collagen. And it also contains calcium, which makes our bones hard. But here we can see our bones would be too hard and brittle if we didn't have collagen. So think of we need the right blend of collagen and calcium to keep our bones having some flexibility yet being hard and resisting fracturing. So again, collagen is 35% of bone and calcium is 65% of bone. In our next video, we'll talk about the function of the different cells of bone tissue.